Hi guys, it's Denma. Welcome to the Wolf's Den and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. And this is part two of my heart story um, Q&A session. So I'm going to answer another two questions, like I said in the first video, which will probably be linked below or at the end. Um, because you don't have to you know, watch them in a certain order, they're just random questions. I've got them from people that I know on Facebook that were curious about my health. Things that Lazy NPC was still curious about, and when I was looking up some medical information to apply to the answers, like questions that other people had asked online, so I figured, okay, I can put down like 30 questions and separate it into two 10 question video or three 10 question videos. So here we are with part two. Um, if you ever have any questions about my heart health or my mental health or anything, anything, I'm an open book. Um, curiosity didn't kill a cat. Um, so even if you think it's TMI, feel free to comment a question, whatever. Um, down below and I can do another Q&A with your questions or if I don't have enough I'll just answer directly. Um, so yeah, we're going to do 11 through 20 and let's go. So question 11, why do you still live with your parents since you're an adult? Yes, I'm 33 years old, I'll be 34 this year. Um, in our little town there isn't um, like the projects or a low income based housing area. Like I said, this town that I live in is less than 300 people in population, and most of those are the kids that go to the school. We come from a little bit further out of the town, because um, pretty the bad the, the boondocks. I mean, well, wow. um, so on my income, because I'm on disability, trying to rent a house or even just a trailer in the trailer park, um, I wouldn't be able to support myself with the rent and then the utilities and then having food because even like we do get food stamps and we only for me and John and Cody and he's at ten, going to be 10 years old autistic child who's very picky because he doesn't like certain textures of food so we have to adjust his um, diet and stuff to things that he will eat which can be pricey only thing we can get is $89 that it won't even cover one trip to the grocery store usually it's if we get what we need for the month it's about two hundred dollars and we always go to food line because they have the best deals and your mvp member and there's mvp specials man they're good i would love to get my own place to be able to display my dolls and action figures and funkos i was just even looking at this room and just thinking if i had a room this size i mean not even this big i can use that wall space to put my dolls up I put my phone codes up, but um, I couldn't afford it. Also, being by myself, um, like say Cody went to school, um, and say I fell or passed out, I might not be able to call an ambulance because I might be unconscious and that could be fatal. Like say something screws up with my pump I don't notice it until it's too late and I pass out or whatever um, luckily nothing like that has ever happened I do get close to passing out sometimes if I ever exert myself but um, I haven't yet um, but I don't feel safe getting like a roommate especially with Coney just because I'm paranoid and lazy NPC would not be coming unless he'd actually contribute to like cleaning um, or doing chores, you know, that type of stuff because he really can't work because he gets monthly kidney stones and gout like he's got gout right now. Um, we can't, he drinks so much Mellow Yellow and they say, or Mountain Dew, and they say that can trigger it, but he doesn't think so even though the doctor said it. Um, also roast beef, I don't like red meats trigger it. So, like we never go to Arby's anymore because if he gets roast beef from Arby's, that triggers it like a few days later he'll get gout. So, it, it's almost like his time of the month type thing. I feel so bad. Um, but he has a, an issue with getting too zoned in to like a video game. Like, for instance, uh, World of Warcraft. I play it, but like, I can put it down. Like, I haven't touched my characters in probably three months. Um, but he's like a daily quester and like, does, does all the daily quests and you know, he's a farm, like farm's gold and stuff like that. 
um, and here's the storm, me and him like to play. Um, that's, I actually like playing that a lot more than Mortal Warcraft because you have, it's like a crossover with all of Blizzard's characters. Um, and then he plays Hearthstone, which is like the World of Warcraft trading card game that's online. So, it's like I'm almost having to take care of two kids when we, are, we were living together. And I'm like, mm -mm. if you aren't working, at least trying to do something, or like having some kind of income coming in, or if you're not going to clean like you're supposed to, or whatnot, you're not coming. Plain and simple. Because um, I've had this happen three times now when we've gotten together, and he just, you know, do, he'll be good for like a week. He, he takes care of Cody pretty well, but like the rest of the house, I'm like, I would come home from work and it would be like, chaos is the best thing I could think between the dog and the cats and Cody making a mess. And it's just like, why didn't you clean this up? I'm like, when I see something's messy, I will clean it up then because I don't want to deal with it later. So, but that's just everything. Question 12. Does Lazy NPC, aka my husband, help with my meds? Honestly, no. I showed him how to do it, how to mix the meds for my cassette and let him do it once, but he doesn't do it on a regular basis or anything because he gets anxiety about it because he does, it's literally how you have my life in your hands when you mix that and if you mix it incorrectly it can be fatal so um and he doesn't really know about all the pills that i take he knows that i take a bunch of pills but he doesn't know their names or what they do even though i've got i have written out like a, a sheet that has what the medicine is the milligram how many times i take it and what it's for so that way if i'm unconscious have to go to the hospital they can just hand it to the nurse or the emt and say here this is what she's on so and I've made that list for my mom, my dad, and for him. And I keep a spare for me in my couch just in case like I'm hyperventilating. Like last time I went to the hospital in an ambulance, I was hyperventilating, couldn't talk, so I handed him the list. And that's the, like the best thing to do if you take a lot of medications, keep a list on you with all the information. Uh, you don't have to put your prescription numbers or the pharmacy you use up there. Just put your medicine up there with strength, how often you take it, and what it's for. Usually the EMTs and stuff know, but it's such a big help and especially with all the chaos of getting to the hospital and all the questions at registration it's, it's easy to do that, help with that i do have really simple instructions written down on the fridge for like there was a couple of days where i was just so i had gotten um cf from the hospital i had stayed at and i was still taking medication for it and it was very draining it's almost like food poisoning but without the vomiting um, and I was just so weak. I didn't have no strength to draw back the syringe or anything um, to get the dilutant out. So I have really easy step-by-step -step instructions on the fridge um, for my mom or my dad or him if they do have to mix a cassette for me. And I'm not able to mix it myself or like directly say how to do it. So my dad learned at Duke, like because your caregivers have to learn. Um, but he's never mixed it. He hasn't touched it since. Um, my mom has because, um, like I said, I came home and I was just too weak and she had to make it. Um, and I was just, I, that was before I had made this easy little direction thing. So I had to point and like, I, said, I couldn't really talk. I was really dizzy and ugh, it was hard, but um, she did it, which is good. So, um, what was the DMPC's reaction to you having these issues? Um, well, the day before we went to that Crown Palace free garden tour, we had got into an argument. I was over it, but I kept, when I got there, we walked in, and it's like about a block of just like the walkway into the like pull around, like um, where they would have the carriages at. And we walked in, I got that far, and I'm like, they had to go to the bathroom, which was attached to the gift shop, which is right when you came in. So I decided to go sit on the benches in the stables because it was kind of hot out there, so the stables were, like, covered. And there was a nice breeze going through, so I sat in there for a while to see if I could catch my breath, and I couldn't. And, um, I said I needed to go to the ER right after getting there. And I think the day before when we had an argument, it was, like... 
but I didn't want to go or something like that that day because I don't know I just didn't I don't know what the argument was about but um when I said I need to go to the ER he got a little attitude and did the whole your mother doesn't want to do this um, so she has to go to the ER and basically blaming me for having to leave because Cody's like why do we have to go so soon um because like they had barely started walking around um like I said I was over the argument but him not believing that I needed to go to the ER um hurt because I'm one of those people that will not go to the ER until it's like vital like you saw the last issue I didn't go to the ER for my palpitations until 20 hours in um, but whenever he has a pain or kidney stones or gout flare up, he has to go to the express care. So I'm just like, I'm telling you, I need to go to the hospital. I don't go to the doctors unless I think I'm dying. So, um, uh, he did apologize a couple days after, um, I had been admitted and I was getting ready to get transferred to the next hospital because he didn't know how serious it was. He just... Kept seeing him take blood and do um, like blood gas tests, 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 and it took me like MRIs and CAT scans and X-rays and echocardiograms and EKGs. He didn't know what all this meant. So, question 14: How has pulmonary hypertension affected your mental health? I touched on this before in the ER hospital vlog. Um, before I wasn't on any medication for my depression because I could fight it, um, but it got to a point where I was losing the battle. Um, so I started Seroquel. Um, initially I felt like a burden because I knew I couldn't really contribute to anything other than um, helping out with the price of groceries and paying my part and releasing PC's part of the phone bill. Um, I tried doing chores around the house, like dishes, but if I stand up for more than about 10 minutes, my back starts hurting excruciatingly. Painful. I just... Crippling is the best way. And sometimes my tramadol doesn't work. Sometimes I still have breakthrough pain. So, um, I can take care of the cats and little things like that fine. But, um, like I can put clothes in the washer machine. Um, but hanging them, I don't know, because we have, I don't, we don't have a dryer. We just have the washer and we hang them on the line outside because we're out in the country. Um, and just reaching up, up and down, up and down so much puts a lot of tension on my chest. I don't know why, but it does. And it's really hard for me to bend over anywhere in my parents' house because I always have this little fanny pack attached. I don't wear it like a fanny pack. I wear it like a purse. So it'll hit something like a dish or something and knock down usually whenever I walk by because my parents have a very cluttered house. We'll put it that way. Um, Back in my camper, I didn't have hardly anything. Like I could walk and bend over and everything fine there. There was a time when I was taking a nap and I had woken up and I still was laying down but I had my eyes closed because I was trying to adjust the um, light because I, with this medicine, I get migraines easier. I have light sensitivity. Um, and I heard my dad like just saying in a very frustrated tone, like every once in a while he'll just go off and start complaining very loudly um he was basically fussing about me not being able to contribute like I don't help anything like that um like I tried it's better than what he's done because he doesn't do a thing um he feeds the dogs at night it's only dead um but it just hurt because when my dad's base said that I was a burden. Um, ever since then, like even with my depression medications, it's always on the back of my mind, knowing that my thoughts about being a burden were confirmed with him. And yeah, he might have just been in the moment and been like frustrated, but still you don't say things like that aloud. Especially when the person that can hear it that you're talking about is in the next room over and the walls are extremely thin so I mean so do you have any side effects um yeah obviously you've seen my fake face it's always flushed unless I have makeup on um that's the main one the other one is jaw pain um if it's been a while since I've eaten and drinking 
eaten. If, I, if it's been a while since I've eaten or drunk anything, um, the first sip or bite of food that I take, I'll have this immense jaw pain. And it's not my like crappy teeth, it's just part, one of these side effects um, that the doctor said will go away, but two years later it's still here. Um, and the last one, like I said, is light sensitivity, um, which can trigger my migraines. Like if I'm going, if I go outside and it's super bright, like I like to only go out when it's overcast and gloomy because I don't have to worry about the sun. But if it goes out and it's really bright, um, it can trigger my migraines. Like turning on a lamp can trigger my migraines because usually I just stay in the dark as often as or as much as possible um, with no lights. And I usually have my computer screen and my phone screen dimmed enough to where it doesn't bother me. So yeah, fun. What was the scariest experience you've had? Last year I had to do my yearly right heart catheter um, so they can measure pressure in your heart, your lungs, and to see how your heart is beating, etc. Um, this was another waking anesthetic type, as I call it, procedure. So I had been given one dose of the anesthesia combination liquid they give IV, um, and I told them I need three doses of it at least because I have a very high tolerance. Um, it's supposed to sedate you and I mean you so you don't feel anything but maybe a little bit of pressure. So they started cutting um, and I started screaming like I was in a horror movie. I could feel everything and I grabbed the doctor or the assistant or whoever it was beside me. I don't know where because I was like crotch level so I just grabbed. I don't think I grabbed his crotch, thank God, because I was just shaking and trembling and they were just saying it's you're doing fine sweetie and i'm like here screaming like bloody murder and telling you i need i can feel this you need to give me more something to numb it up more or sedate me and they just didn't and it just it's traumatized me because the first two times i got that procedure done it was fine but this last time because i have to do it every year um but I won't be doing it again because I told them I needed three doses before they even started like sedating me and started for the procedure during prep when they were getting things shaved because they um sometimes they can go in through like your inner thigh area um and sometimes most of the time they go into your neck um yeah it's like they, they, they take three doses of the mixture I don't know what the mixture is but it's three about rounds of it and that makes up uh, it doesn't knock me out but i don't, usually don't remember anything once it kicks in and i don't feel pain obviously um i was really ticked off afterwards because i told them that and i told them that i had a high tolerance to like sedating medications because i take ambien and clonopin and that type of stuff every night for sleeping and anxiety so Anything that's sedating, I have get high tolerance to most of the time. Um, do you think you they would have given me enough after I started screaming? Do you think they would have given me another dose because it was making me squirm like and tremble and they probably couldn't get accurate readings, but no, they didn't. So yeah. I guess I should have complained to like one of their person like, not PR people, but they're like what is it? social workers I guess they have there but I didn't um yeah just I was so scared that's terrifying because I could still move it wasn't paralyzing me enough to where I was sedated enough to where I couldn't move and it was just I can't imagine somebody going in for a surgery like that or like a not like that but another surgery that's probably like say my gallbladder getting taken out, being awake and not being able to get, like being able to feel it, it just like, oh my gosh, I couldn't imagine. Like these people that have like waking up during anesthesia, but they're like still paralyzed, so they can't do anything but scream internally. Oh my god, I I, I can relate to it on a small scale, but I just. 17, what was your favorite moment while in the hospital? Definitely the pet therapy. Um, the first time I was admitted and the episode that I had to go for, be admitted the following year, um, I stayed, the first time was almost, it was a little over a month, the second time was about a month, and I was by myself, three hours away from home, 
um, the like only people that talk like called me um, was my mom and my sister, who lives like an hour and a half away, came and visited um, for a few minutes, but no other calls or DMs or whatever from the rest of my family. Um, so I was just depressed and. Uh, Yeah, just depressed. I would say I was kind of cranky, but I was cranky when I didn't get enough sleep, so they ended up having, to, like, they put in orders not to wake me up until, like, a certain time, and, like, they would group all my, like, in the morning, they'd group getting vitals and drawing blood and stuff at the same time instead of waking me up at 5 a.m., drawing blood, then let me sleep for an hour, and then come in and doing vitals and waking me up, because once I'm up, I'm up, um, and it's hard for me to get back to sleep before I started taking the Rimuron or the Mirtazapine, so, um, but yeah, I had pet therapy the first two years, and they were both older golden retrievers, they were actually the same breeder, and they were related, I can't remember how, but, um, one was named, um, Aspen, and one was named Anna, I don't know, after Frozen, or if it's just, she had that, well, she had to have that name before Frozen, because she was, like, 12 years old, so, um, The first time I was in the hospital, I had my computer with me, so I was playing with a lot of World of Warcraft because I couldn't really do much. Um, so Lazy NPC surprised me with the Spectral Tiger Club companion pet, which is a very rare companion pet that I think you might have to have a loot card for, but you can sell it on the auction house, um, and that's where he got it from. So he's, he's, I had the Spectral Tiger um, Hunter pets. I don't have the mount, that's the last thing I need, but I've got both versions of this, like the pink and the purplish, bluish color Spectral Tiger pets, and the one I use the most, I have Veyron and the little Spectral Tiger cub I named Bugatti, like B-O-O-G-A-T-I, like a ghost Bugatti, um, so, because I love the Bugatti Veyron car, so, hopefully I will get a Spectral Tiger mount one of these days. I have enough gold in my account to find, buy one if, it, if I ever seen one on the auction house, but I haven't seen one on, ever since I've gotten the mount of gold, I haven't seen one on the auction house, so it's like, ugh. I have the Celestial Steed, which is like spectral as well, and like, that was like one of the first mounts you could buy in the store, so like everybody had it. So, like, yay, the sparkly pony. <laughs> Yeah, he did that, and then I was able to get enough gold to buy the their actual dead cats. They're like ghost cats. There's two of them, Mr. Bigglesworth, and I can't remember the other one. But they um they're they're clear, like ghosty looking, and they have little pe like fog animations around them. So I like them. I like them a lot. I'm so happy when I got them. Like those were like the three companion pets I wanted the most in this whole game. Cause I've gotten all the other cats. I even have the like white kitten that's Alliance. Like you have to be an Alliance character or use a neutral um, auction house to do. Question 18, have you ever had an emergency with your pump? Not in public, thankfully, but uh, I did have one issue when I was going around the corner um, and we had a Pizza Hut box on top of the trash can so we could take that out with the trash. And my IV line snagged it. I didn't think anything of it because it snags everything. I, Whenever I move somewhere, it's a pain in the butt. Um, but about 15 minutes later, like, my extremities were freezing. They were turning almost blue. And I just started looking at my machine, like, seeing if my pump was on or something, or if the batteries had died and it didn't warn me about it. Because it will beep if the batteries get low. Um, an alarm. And I didn't do that, and I happened to feel up my line, and I happened to see that it was ripped, and I wasn't getting enough medication like I was supposed to, to be doing all the what it was supposed to efficiently. So, I had to switch out the line really fast, and then, it was the same time, I was trying to switch out the line because you have about two minutes of not having the machine on before your heart starts having issues and starts not reacting very well. And this part got stuck, like I couldn't twist it off. My dad had to come in with pliers and rush in and like crack it to get it off. I don't know how it got that tight on me. Um, but then I put the other line on it, I had to prime the line, and got it on, and about 
10 minutes, my, I started like feeling my extremities again and stuff like that. So that was kind of scary. Um, but those are the only two that I know of. I'm very careful with my tubing. Like I know if I snag something, how far I can, eat, how far I can go, or if the dog runs through it, like Gretchen, which is one of my parents' dogs, ran and snagged it. But luckily I had seen her get down, so I had grabbed it way down here. So it wouldn't even pull up here. And I'm like holding it so it doesn't pull while my parents get her untangled. So she's only like a 20 pound dog. So it wasn't like she was gonna rip it out, I don't think. But I'm always super aware of where my line is, making sure it's not like, like my mom accidentally shut it in the door of the car. And luckily, I happened to look down and see that it was stuck down there, so I had to, because it would have blocked it off and I wouldn't have been able to get any medicine through. So, it didn't hurt the line, it was just pinched. So, you just have to be very careful. Let's see, okay, question 19. Is there anything you used to be able to do before the diagnosis that you can't do now? Um, yes, swimming, that is the beginning. Um, I love swimming. Um, I only swim in pools or the bathtub <laughs> because if I can't see through the water, I'm not going in it. Um, when I used to go up to my grandma's in Colonia Beach, Virginia, um, they had this one area with a big net around it that kept like fish out, but jellyfish could still get through because they don't. And I am so lucky I never got stung, but you could see them. And I was like, when I started getting older and going there, I'm like, uh uh. I don't know how, I just didn't pay attention to this when I was a kid, but even here in Aurora, the, um, you can see jellyfish in the rivers. And we had a dolphin in the river, um, we took a sailboat out one day, um, and it was like a, it wasn't a gray dolphin, it was almost like a mauve color. I don't know if it was sick and going someplace to die, because there wasn't any other dolphins, it was the only one, or if it just got lost, but, um, yeah. Um, if I can't see the water, I'm not going in it. Um, no, I, I have thought of a theory of how I could possibly go swimming, which I've kind of asked the doctor about, and he said it should be alright, which is basically putting a couple of extension tubing sets on this, and putting my pump into a Ziploc bag and zipping it up so it won't get wet, and putting it outside of the pool, because I have, um, clear things like this that are you stick over this and it's waterproof and they actually work um because you're supposed to use them when you take baths or showers but I just change this out afterwards um when I shower so or bath I don't shower I take baths um and like keeping it on the edge of the pool or like the one we had that we need to set up we got last fall just sitting it outside the pool but I would I couldn't go underwater and I'd have to be very careful about who's playing around me because the line would be underwater and I couldn't, can't really see it. So, like, I'd have to isolate myself in, like, a little corner or something. So, also, jumping on trampolines, like the big ones, I've always wanted one since I was a kid. Not, it's like I have room for it at my parents' house and I'm sure Cody would love it. So, I still might get him one. I don't want $215. But I can't get on it because a, I jump close to the edge where those, the coils are and my line gets caught in that. It's not good. So, I love, that was like one of my favorite ways to exercise was jumping on a trampoline. Because you can burn some calories jumping on a trampoline. And swimming is a really good way for, to get exercise without putting a lot of pressure on your joints. Like for my back pain, I can get like a lot of good exercise and just sitting there walking back and forth in the water. Or doggy paddling as I can, that's the only thing I have only way I can swim is doggy paddling. Um, normal things like walking without the assistance of a scooter bugs me and not being able to work irritates me. Um, not being able to lift over 10 pounds even though I can and like seeing my muscle mass and just like slowly fade away because I can't overexert myself with exercise and it's just it's frustrating. It's just the normal little things most of the time that get to me. Like your day-to-day tasks. Like you don't swim or jump on the trampoline every day. But um, Question 20. The last question for this set is what was your favorite and worst situation with the doctors or nursing staff? Um, my favorite was the second time I had been admitted 
to the hospital at Duke and I had I was there alone for about a month and there was one nurse who was a mother of three um, her name was Shannon and she felt me she made me feel so much better like mentally so I was just depressed and when she came on shift like they would switch out like every three four days because they worked 12 hour shifts like four 12 hour shifts in a row I think is how they did it and you can really feel like the motherly attention and vibe off of her. She was treating me like I was one of her, she had three daughters. She was treating me like I was her own kid and it was so nice. And um, she would get me, she got me the pet therapy and that cheered me up. And then she would get me, um, they have different other type of therapies like music, like they'll get people, somebody to come play a guitar or something outside of your room in the hall or in your room. They have volunteers that come and do that, but I don't want that. Um, but she got me the art type therapy, which is a, a batch of like coloring books and pencils and crayons and like watercolor and just it's, it's in a little packet, it was really nice. Um, and she would like take me out in a wheelchair and wheel me outside so I can get some sun and some fresh air and just get out of the hospital room for a few minutes. Um, because in the NICU at Duke, that's basically the wing where all their critical recovery patients are, like all the people with the heart and lung transplants are there. I can't tell you how many times I saw people run with the crash cart and I'm like, I don't even know if the person survived. I mean, that was just all of a sudden you hear, I think code blue and people start running and with the cra this huge toolbox looking like wheels toolbox kind of thing, like the clear thing. <laughs> this is, um, I don't know if they were going to use that or they lived. I never saw them take any bodies out. So, um, but yeah, she was um, trying to. She's been there, or she had been there a while, and she was going um, to, to. She was working towards being in the life flight program, which is the EMTs that use the helicopters. They're not the pilots, but the the nurses inside with the pilots, like your escort. Um, they have to be certified via life flight. Um, and she was going for that. So the second time I was admitted, um, I mentioned it to one of my nurses and um, I was like, oh. cause she comes down to the, when I go there for observation, I go to the dialysis unit and every year I've had the same room. I don't know how that happens. Cause that unit has 50 rooms. And I always get room 70 to 25. I don't know why, but um, Shri, which was a male nurse that was very nice. Um, he left like a week before I had went this past year to do to be admitted. I was like, oh, because I see in the past two years. But um, I asked about Shannon because she came down to that unit transferring people a lot. So I, I asked, have you heard from Shannon? How's she doing? How's her life flight doing? Because I remember most of my nurses from the previous years. Like I remember you, or I know this one. She's got an attitude. I ain't talking to her. Cause there was one nurse that just she was a little older like in her 40s but um she didn't have a very good bedside manner so but um i was alone and all of a sudden she comes in he's like i got a surprise for you and i'm like okay and in walks shannon and she just comes and gives me a hug and i just immediately start bawling because my mom had gone home to be with my dad because yeah, i think he was having his uh, LASIK or his eye cataract treatment thing and she had been had to drive him home and you know, take care of him I was like go ahead I'm, I'm fine I don't want to go anywhere so she went home to deal with that and she, oh my god she just hugged me I just bawled and um, cause I was so depressed and Shree was really good at like keeping up conversations and stuff like that but then I'm here alone and it's just Even thinking about it now, I'm like, I can feel my eyes rolling up. I mean, I missed her so bad. Like, I wanted to friend her on Facebook, but I know that's not the right thing to do. Like, it probably is kind of creepy too um, afterwards, but it's like, it doesn't feel like it's ethical. It might interfere. Like, see, I have to go back there again, and she's there working. And I don't want to be like, like, have a relationship like that that might make me favorite so to speak or something like that like I don't know like maybe one of the preferred patients 
Um, but yeah, she's great. And she did end up doing the life flight and, and getting certified. So um, I didn't see her the past two times I've been at Duke though. So, but that's like a job that I'm not gonna see anybody because they come in off the helicopter and in the back way through the hospital. So you don't see them. Um, our runner up was on my second minute admit minutes on my second trip to the um doctor um or the hospital the doctor watching over me and taking care of me was really into comics and other nerdy and geeky stuff so after he would get done with rounds and visiting all the patients and making sure everything was okay he'd come in and we'd talk comics for like 10 20 30 minutes um my worst experience of that right heart catheter procedure um, was with the doctors. The last time I was admitted for observation, um, my mom was with me and one of the doctors doing rounds said, your medicine is failing you. It didn't bother me at the time, um, but that night I was just watching Lincoln Park videos and like I had realized that these videos, the lyrics, I'd always liked Lincoln Park and this is right after Chester killed himself and I was like, these lyrics are exactly how I feel, like spot on, like Meteora and Hybrid Theory, those albums, and the song in the end. Um, and I just remember thinking about your medicine's failing you, you've been on it two years, and it's not doing a thing for you other than keep you alive, basically. It's not helping your heart shrink, because that's one of the things it's supposed to do. My heart is like reversed. It's like the right side is huge, the left side is little, and it, I don't know. I don't think it's supposed to be like that. I think it's re like reversed. It's not like literally reversed. There is like a condition where your heart is reversed inside your body, but it's not that. Um, but yeah, I just started like just silently crying, not like boo-hooing, but like tears were just running down and uh, it like hit me that it's basically this medicine I've been on this pump for two years. It's not helping me. And I haven't been able to do things I want to do, and it's like frustrating. And it's oh, it's brought down my mental health a lot um, by limiting what I can do. So I just sat there silently crying. My mom was asleep, thank goodness, so she didn't see me crying. Um, Cause I was like I said, I stay up all night and sleep during the day. So um, yeah. That is the end of this part. Um, I'll be doing part three right here in a second. Um, but yeah, if you want to watch part one or three, they should be linked in the description below or at the end of the video. Um, yeah, because you don't have to watch them in any certain order, but if you do have any more questions or curious curiosity thing, if you're curious about anything, um, like, subscribe, join the pack, we'd love to have you here, and I will see you in part three, hopefully. Bye.